Well, thank you for the introduction, and uh, Aaron and I have talked, and I think I'm going to go first and kind of set the table for her, because uh, hopefully, as you can see from uh, the title of this, this my what I am addressing today, the individual, I really do see as one side of the coin, uh, kind of uh, teeing things up for the other side of it, which is the systemic uh, attention to these issues. So hopefully, uh, you'll see this as complementary. Um, so I'm grateful to be here. Uh, thank you to Bob and Vince for this conference, for the opportunity to be here. Um, this is, as I was saying in my comments, tremendously exciting. Um, this is something that I think is so needed, this interdisciplinary work, and I'm grateful for it. Um, so I've been working on Laudato Si really since it was rumored to be released. Um, as I work with the Catholic Climate Covenant, we work with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and so we've been uh, essentially prepping for this for uh, about a year and a half, almost two years now. Uh, this summer when it came out, uh, my wife and the partners and my colleagues in D.C. started referring to themselves as papal widows and widowers because we were spending so much time together on this document. So we've, I've spent hours on this, and so I'm really excited to talk about implementation and specifically individual responses today with you. Um, so what I want to do is just run briefly through kind of a framework to think about this because I think it's important to go systematically through this rather than just scattershot. And I think a really helpful way to do this is the pastoral circle. Um, so hopefully some of you are familiar with this. This is from uh, Peter Henrio and Joe Holland in their 1983 book, uh, Social Analysis, Linking Faith and Justice. And I'll just run through this because I think it provides a helpful way to think about both the encyclical and our individual responses. Um, so the pastoral circle is made up of these four uh, movements. And so the first one starts with insertion. And this is really um, where we're inserted into a situation and we just kind of take stock of what's around us. We look around and say, what's happening? Who's involved? What are the systems that are, that are operative uh, in this situation? Insertion then moves to social analysis, and this is where we dig into some of the deeper questions. How do systems and structures and ideologies contribute to the situation that we see around us? The third movement then for people of faith is theological reflection, and this is where uh, we draw on the tradition and the resources within our tradition to ask questions like, is this situation consistent with our faith tradition? Uh, and we can also provide unique insights about the causes and consequences of the things that we see around us. And following theological reflection then, we move to pastoral planning, and this is really where the rubber meets the road, as it were, uh, and we begin to ask questions, so what can we do about all of this? Uh, so I think it's a, it's a helpful way to frame this, and I think it's important to point out that it's a circle, but Holland and Henry also point out that it's a spiral, because once we've begun to pastorally plan, we're then inserted into a new situation where we're then called and invited to begin this process again. So it's really a dynamic process that doesn't just end with the pastoral planning. Uh, so I'll just run through the encyclical because I think it can be mapped onto the, the uh, circle and, and I won't spend a whole lot of time with this because I'll be essentially reviewing the, the things that my colleagues at the conference have done this weekend, but uh, just to kind of uh, map this out for you, I think it's a helpful exercise uh, and it sets the tone for individual responses. So first, Francis inserts himself onto the landscape of uh, environmental challenges today. So this is essentially the outline of the, the titles of uh, the different chapter, or the sections of chapter one of the encyclical talks about pollution, climate change, water, biodiversity. Um, he also looks at human creation because as the conference says, everything is connected, including humanity. So we are part of this. And so uh, he looks at the decline of the quality of human life, the breakdown of society, and global inequality. In addition, he places himself uh, and inserts himself into the conversation uh, about environmental degradation. And so here he points out the continuity with interlocutors. So he points out the papal precedent. He points to Patriarch Bartholomew. He looks at philosophers, a Sufi mystic. So he situates himself in the conversation both ecologically uh, and with his interlocutors who are addressing this issue. So then Francis moves to the second stage of social analysis, and this is where we've been talking a lot about uh, some of the responses, or some of the dynamics, the causes and consequences. Uh, he looks at weak international political responses undermined by special interests. I think uh, uh, paragraph 56 is one of the most hard-hitting of the document, uh, and so I've, I've read that several, several times. Uh, he talks about technocracy or the technocratic paradigm, uh, these dynamics of power, control, growth, consumerism, the throwaway culture, compartmentalization of uh, knowledge. Uh, and so I'm, I'm running through this because this has all been covered this weekend, but I think it's a, uh, a helpful way to frame it. Uh, he looks at anthropocentrism and the practical relativism. And the, and the relativism comes in because 
the, anthrop the anthropocentrism, the, the placing ourselves above, on top of, outside of creation, uh, relativizes the importance of non-human creation based on human utility. And so this is where the practical rel relativism comes in in his analysis uh, of our present environmental challenges. So then Francis moves to the, to the third step of the circle, the, pa the theological reflection, and here he, I, would, I would suggest that he draws on uh, what Tom Massaro, uh, Jesuit uh, at Berkeley, calls the four sources of Christian ethics. So revelation, tradition, reason, and experience. And so Francis points out the moral dimensions of environmental degradation, as MT was uh, so eloquently talking about the connection between uh, ecology and the option for the poor and vulnerable, uh, is one example that Francis consistently weaves throughout the document. Uh, and he also suggests insights uh, with which to move forward. So he talks about the universal destination of goods, solidarity, subsidiarity. So these are uh, theological resources that we can contribute to the conversation. So then we move to pastoral planning, and here I want to pause because I think it's really helpful to recognize that there are essentially two ways in which pastoral plan, or two levels at which pastoral planning can happen. And I think here it's helpful to, to refer to the U.S. bishops, uh, the two feet of love in action. Uh, and I'm, we'll talk about this as uh, contributors to the volume. I'm not sure the terms are entirely accurate, but I think it's a helpful way to set this up. And so what the bishops really, really talk about here is the distinction between what they call charity and social justice. And charity is understood as the individual responses, the discrete local actions um, that we can, we can take in response to the situations we see around us. And that's, that's certainly one part of the equation, one side of the coin, and that's what I'm addressing here. But what the bishops emphasize, and, and it's not just the bishops, they're drawing on the compendium of the social doctrine of the church and the, the corpus of Catholic social teaching, is that individual actions always have to be complemented by social justice or the systemic treatment of systems level causes of the situations around us. And so they talk about adequately addressing challenges by walking with the two feet of love and action. And so I say that because I think it's, it's, it would be an impoverished reading of this chapter or um, listening to my talk if it didn't happen in conjunction with what Aaron's gonna talk about uh, the systems level. And I think it's also important because I think our society tends to emphasize charity to the exclusion of justice, um, both in an environmental context as well as uh, when we think about other pressing socio-political and economic challenges. So I think it's really important to, to emphasize the two feet uh, and the, the two feet of love and action. So I'll be looking at the individual, and so I think this is where we can start to think about pastoral planning and kind of categorize this, and, and a lot of work has already been done in this area, so I'm really just kind of synthesizing. Um, I think it's helpful to kind of organize this into the categories of our own lives, and so here I'll be looking at consumption and disposal. Here I think we can talk about products, energy, food, water, and healthcare. Healthcare is actually a new one um, for me that I've been thinking more about, and I think it's, it actually makes sense when you connect the dots because everything is connected. Uh, and then also transportation. I think these are some of the main, you know, kind of uh, pillars of our own daily lives that we can think about with respect to sustainability. So the consumption and disposal, I think it's, it's helpful before we start looking at the different categories to, to think about the framework or the terms with which we think about these issues. Um, the first is want versus need. I think this is important because a lot of our overconsumption is the result of satisfying our wants rather than our needs. So I think this is important uh, to help frame the conversation. We can also talk about excess versus simplicity. And here, simplicity is connected to the virtue of temperance, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but I think it's, that's one of the ethical coordinates we can look at. Uh, and then externalities. This is something that Tony was talking about uh, with respect to economics. This is, again, the idea that the true cost of goods and services aren't fully incorporated into the market price that we pay. And, uh, as the uh, conversation has gone this weekend, especially uh, with a carbon price. Carbon price doesn't capture, or a carbon price would internalize the externalities uh, of energy costs that aren't fully borne uh, or reflected in the market. So I think these are some ways to, to think about these, uh, these different uh, responses that we can have as individuals. So with respect to products, I think this is uh, kind of where the old adage reduce, reuse, recycle can come in. It's uh, you know, been around since the 70s, 80s, 90s, but uh, I think it still is helpful. Um, with respect to reducing, I think we can, we can, I would encourage us to think about the misnomer of green purchasing. Um, 
I think that's, that's a problem because it suggests that we can kind of buy our way out of this problem, that if we just buy different products, uh, everything will be okay. And I think that really doesn't address the underlying reality that we consume too many resources. And so we'll actually have to reduce our consumption levels. One of the speakers pointed out that it would take between four and five Earths uh, if the entire world consumed at American levels. And so we're not just talking about different consumption, we're talking about reduced consumption. Uh, we can talk about reusing, so uh, buying used products uh, and also sharing products. So again, buying used secondhand reduces the amount of new materials that go through the system, uh, go through the system of production. Uh, we, can, we can look at sharing in terms of especially big ticket items, um, lawnmowers in your neighborhood, things like that. So these are practical ways that, uh, that we can think and, and kind of frame the way in which we think about our own lives with respect to sustainability. And then obviously recycling, hopefully uh, in this day and age, in, in 2016, this is uh, kind of uh, boilerplate, but it, it uh, recovers resources, avoids the extraction of new materials. So I think this is um, reduce, reuse, recycle with regards to products is still a useful way to think about all of this. So we can look at energy. Uh, and here I think we can look at three, three ways of, of categorizing this with respect to type, quantity, and efficiency. So with type, we can look at the types of energy we're buying. Are we, are we buying renewables? Are we putting solar on our, on our roofs? Um, but I think we can also look at some of the tools um, that help us to purchase different types of energy. And here I'm thinking of renewable energy credits. Uh, so this is where customers pay the utility a higher rate to have renewables added to the grid's fuel mix. So you don't actually have um, the hardware on your house or your, uh, your workplace, but this, uh, this is a way to add renewables to the shared energy mix. Uh, so it's a way to, to address energy types. Uh, quantity, again, this is uh, something I think is fairly straightforward. Unplugging electronics and appliances, changing screen settings, all of these things. Uh, they're, they're the little things, but it's the, it's the stuff of everyday life, as MT was saying, that uh, we, can, we can kind of look at these uh, opportunities for, uh, for sustainability. And then efficiency, this is something that I think is, is underutilized, especially with regard to resources. Um, so we can, a lot of, a lot of utilities uh, pr will provide or do energy audits for free, especially on um, uh, communal buildings, so like churches, rectories, things like that. They can actually get a free energy audit. You can do it for your home as well. So I think there are efficiency ways that we can look at energy. Uh, so we might not all do uh, an energy audit, but we all have to eat. And so I think this is a real opportunity to think about sustainability in the context of our day-to-day -day living. Here I'm, I'm referencing and drawing on a lot from Julie Rubio in her chapter uh, in Green Discipleship on Eating. So she talks about less meat and fewer animal by byproducts. Uh, and so this is, as we've been talking about, kind of the carbon footprint, meat-rich diets result in twice as much carbon uh, emissions from uh, essentially production, consumption, disposal, as do uh, vegan and vegetarian diets. So this is one way to reduce our own carbon footprint with uh, what we eat. We can look at more organic produce, and this avoids the fossil fuel-based fertilizers and pesticides, GMOs, things like that. So um, thinking about what we buy uh, and the way it's produced is another way to think about sustainability in terms of our own consumption. Um, and then more local and seasonal produce. So this, this looks at uh, and avoids the quote unquote food miles, uh, the distance that food travels from farm to uh, distribution to our plates. And so this is a way to think about uh, reducing those food miles buying locally. Uh, and then more whole foods and cooking from scratch. So kind of the, the simpler we can make things, uh, the more sustainable it is within, with respect to packaging and preservatives, uh, all of these different things. So I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, as individuals to, to better care for creation when we think about this in terms of what we eat. Uh, closely tied to food is water, and I think this is, again, something that, uh, as I take a drink, something that is, is ubiquitous in our daily lives, and we can, we can think about this in several ways. One is direct consumption, and so we can think about the water that we use just day to day, uh, the quantity that we use, so taking shorter showers, things like that, avoiding bottled water. Again, hopefully this is review for uh, for most of the folks in this room, but uh, uh, avoiding bottled water avoids the energy associated with transportation, with disposal of the plastic, so water is an opportunity. But I think we can also think about virtual water, and here this is kind of edging towards the systems thinking again, but I think this is where these things start to interface. Um, so virtual water is the idea of calculating the amount of water that goes into the production of 
products and goods and services that we would purchase. And so um, there are ways and, and helpful resources. So this is virtual water. And it, this, this attempts to map out how much water goes into the production of everyday things uh, that we eat, that we drink, that we consume. Um, I'm looking at this. I, uh, my, my virtual water footprint uh, from coffee has been higher in the last 10 weeks. I have a newborn at home, so I've been drinking <laughs> a lot of coffee and using a lot of virtual water. Um, but obviously, the, the biggest kind of uh, water consumer or water uh, virtual water consumer on here is beef. So beef, uh, one steak, three, uh, 300 grams of beef uses 4,500 liters of water. So again, uh, thinking about the ways we eat impacts the ways that we consume water uh, and virtual water. So healthcare is one that I've been thinking more about, and I'm, I'm referencing Judy Vesey, a nursing professor at Boston College, who talked about this recently uh, when she came and talked to my students. But healthcare, uh, the healthcare sector consumes and is responsible for a tremendous amount of resource consumption and disposal. So uh, a hospital produces between 25 and 30 pounds of waste per bed per day. So if you've ever been in the hospital, you think about all of the um, gloves, all of the IV, all of the gauze, all of the tubing, um, all of that is, is designed to be single use. Uh, and so it uh, generates a tremendous amount of waste. We also look at energy, so hospitals consume five and a half percent of all energy delivered to the commercial sector in the U.S., uh, and the healthcare ministry is responsible for about eight percent of domestic carbon emissions. And so um, I think this, this is really kind of a connection that I've begun to make in my own mind that attention to diet, exercise, and sleep can prevent illness, which in turn prevents the consumption of healthcare and the prevention of the consumption of healthcare prevents the consumption and, and disposal of God's creation. So I think these are, when we think about lifestyle, I think there are different ways that aren't immediately evident, but when we begin to think about the interconnectedness uh, is, is a helpful way to think about it. Finally, transportation. I think this is, uh, again, kind of ubiquitous in all of our own lives. I'm, I'm uh, in the chapter, I'll talk about the preferential option for the low carbon. So I think this is uh, a way to maybe add a faith dimension to all the things that I think we all probably know, walking, biking, public transit, ride sharing, all of these things. Um, but again, there are opportunities in our everyday lives. Uh, so there, there are a lot of options, a lot of opportunities, and I think there's no one size fits all. Everybody's lifestyle is different. Everybody has different disposable resources, incomes. And so in thinking about how to, how to approach this uh, as a good Jesuit educated person, I think here the, the examination of conscience or uh, the, the examen can help us begin to reflect and think about how we can live more sustainably. And I think this is really an exercise in the environmental, ecological, spirituality that Francis talks about in La Dato Si. Um, so, the eco, so the environmental, so the um, examen is a prayer developed by St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. And in it, a person takes time to reflect on their day, to recognize where God was present, where the person responded or resisted God's love, and to think about how they might respond better to God's invitation of love tomorrow. Uh, and so there have been different versions of the examen that have been developed uh, to uh, address different situations. And Joseph Carver has developed what he calls the ecological examen. And he asks a series of questions that I think are, are helpful and can help us discern our own responses. So he asks, all creation reflects the beauty and blessing of God's image. Where was I most aware of this today? Can I identify and pinpoint how I made a conscious effort to care for God's creation during this day? What challenges or joys do I experience as I recall my care for creation? How can I repair my breaks, with, my breaks in my relationship with creation and in my unspoken sense of superiority? And as I imagine tomorrow, I ask for the grace to see the incarnate Christ in the dynamic interconnectedness of all creation. And so I think this is a, a helpful way to, to think and discern about how we can live sustainably in our own lives. Uh, I've generated a series of additional questions that draw specifically from Laudato Si, but I won't, uh, in the interest of time, go over them right now. Uh, and I want to close with this question of why bother? And I think this is something that I struggle with in my own life. Why, why bother? Um, you know, I'm, I was a, a sociology major, so I'm a social scientist by training, and I'm, I'm inclined to think about the systems level, uh, structural dynamics of all of this. And so uh, in the face of global climate change and irreversible tipping points, why bother? Is my taking a shorter, colder shower really going to matter? Um, 
practically, no, it's not really going to. I mean, I think if, if I'm trying to make that connection directly, it's not there. Um, but I do think as people of faith, there are at least two reasons for why we should still be concerned about taking individual actions. The first has to do with fidelity, or you might call it integrity. Uh, so hopefully, as you've seen from this conference, if you didn't already know it, uh, care for creation is an integral dimension of the Christian life. It's woven into the fabric of who we are. Um, and that's independent of efficacy. And so I think this is a really helpful quote from uh, John Coleman, a Jesuit, who uh, was quoted in um, the Alliance of Religion and Conservation as saying, quote, what if our efforts don't, st what, if, what if our efforts don't stop climate change and we don't save the planet from ourselves? Is the wrong question. The right question is, were we faithful to our tradition and to our teaching? And so I think this is really helpful, that at the end of the day, that's the right question. Were we faithful to our tradition, um, to the, the four sources of Christian ethics? Did we live in a way that was consistent uh, with those teachings and those values. I think the second reason then to care about individual actions has to do with virtue. So from Aristotle to Augustine to Aquinas, there's this recognition that repeated actions form habits and habits form or can be understood as dispositions to act similarly in the future. Uh, and so when we, when we think about virtue and vice, that's a way to name habits. So virtues are habits that are oriented towards the good, Vices can be understood as habits that are oriented to the not good, uh, and, and we can categorize different types of virtue. And here I want to focus or, or name the virtue of temperance, which is uh, the virtue wherein reason governs the appetite for pleasure. And so I think when we think about temperance uh, in the context of individual life choices, something like taking a shorter shower can, can help form a disposition that inclines me to moderate my own consumption of resources. And I think this, in turn, can shape me into the type of person uh, who accepts and possibly <coughs> pursues actions and policies designed to better care for God's creation. So I think, uh, in the end, individual actions are important because they shape our, our character and our dispositions. And so I think they're, they're important in that regard. So. Um, Hopefully this has been helpful uh, as, as kind of an overview. I, as I said, a lot of this is probably known to all of you, but um, hopefully it was a, a helpful way to, to frame it within the context of Laudato Si. Uh, hopefully you've gotten at least some new resources to think about your own lifestyles. Uh, and hopefully, if nothing else, you've taken away that individual actions in the Catholic tradition have to be paired with the systemic responses. Um, it's the two feet of love and action, two sides of the same coin. So, um, so I thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to our conversation, and I turn it over to the other side of the coin. <laughs>